Okay. Welcome to the second part of our uh, short course on from linear algebra to functional analysis. And I would like to give you a, a, another uh, comparison or orientation. Somehow my feeling is that the area is quite big. And that of course, because I'm very familiar with the area, I think everything is easily explained and I can give a lot of explanations. But I also know the effect if you are giving people a lot of explanations how easy it is, then it looks complicated. So I will try to concentrate on certain aspects. So the first thing I want to tell you is whenever I do MATLAB, uh, it's really under changing uh, motivation or so. Um, well, I, I did uh, the, the theory of modulation spaces in the early 80s long before I had any knowledge about uh, mathematical software and so on. So it was essentially, I tried to find a concept of smoothness on locally compatible groups. And because on the general group, think even of the torus, you don't have dilations, uh, which is different from the ordinary Euclidean case. So I thought, well, what are the concepts that I know? So it was take the Fourier transform, uh, take a translation, take a translation in time, take a translation in frequency and so on. And somehow I was coming up with the concept of what is now called modulation spaces or so. Uh, then we thought uh, there is a theory behind it and that was called co-orbit co theory. And the motivation was very often, well, this short time Fourier transform, which we look at a lot, uh, looks like a band limited functions in modern terminology. So band limited function is simply a function whose Fourier spectrum is a bounded interval or a bounded domain or so. So these are all smooth functions, typically and two functions which are smooth and where the support of the Fourier transform is a bounded set. Uh, but then it turned out that there are certain analogies and other uh, differentiations. So, uh, in the abelian case, you have something, certain things which are not possible, like an idempotent in L1. Just think of an ordinary L1 function. If you convolve it by itself, it's never equal to itself because it would mean that the Fourier transform is not allowed to decay at infinity or identically zero, of course. And uh, that's not interesting. But in non commutative groups, you can have such things. So slowly we are realizing that the theory is related to irregular sampling. And then we wanted to, I, I was interested in 89 to see what the engineers were doing. And that's why I started to do uh, MATLAB experiments. So at the beginning, it was like uh, implementation of theoretically established things. We had algorithms, but only in an abstract way, I wanted to see the numerical side. So this is definitely one of the things or you can even say, as people in numerical analysis say, misconceptions of numerical linear algebra that you're just saying, instead of computing an inverse matrix by hand, you're doing it by means of mathematical software. So um, nowadays, it's the way how I used it last time is quite different. I was using it as a demonstration. So kind of, I know what kind of features the general theory has. The general theory includes the finite dimensional theory, and so the demonstration already should give you an idea what you can expect from the other duration. Now, sometimes I have used MATLAB in order to get an idea about how things could work. I mean, the theory of Gabor multipliers to a large extent was based on such intuitions based on numerical simulations. So somehow you have to be able to build a Gabor multiplier, which is of course, an operator composed by taking Gabor coefficients, multiplying these coefficients and then synthesizing. So you have to know how to do this in an efficient way before you can study the operator and the eigenvalues and all these things. But in that part of the theory, I was going much more from numerical experiment to intuition and then to theory. If you see certain things, you think that cannot be, gender. This this is something that must have a reason, a theoretical reason. So then the theoretical justification comes afterwards. What is ahead of us, so because you are certainly interested in what kind of research questions might there be, is the quantitative theory. So sometimes I'm saying in Gabor analysis, we are at the level of Riemann integration. We know that continuous functions have an integral. But we don't know the speed of the integral, I mean, the, the speed of the convergence of the Riemannian sums, 
we might be happy to have a very efficient algorithm for Riemann integration um, for functions which have maybe two continuous and bounded derivatives or so. So for a selected subset of problems, we would like to have efficient algorithms when we compute things in the discrete domain, we would like to infer on the continuous domain and all these things. So these things are different in the sense that, of course, for the engineer, the outcome is relevant. That's like the user wants to have a fast and efficient car. Uh, the one who is building the car has to understand how to build the car. And therefore, he has to know better how to argue and uh, to justify and get the guarantees and maybe the proofs, the rates of convergence and so on. And for this, definitely you need some form of, fun of functional analysis because the continuous domain always allows so much freedom that you're not stuck with finite dimensional spaces. And therefore, you need infinite dimensional spaces and convergence concepts. So at least topological vector spaces or Banach spaces or Hilbert spaces, or as I suggest, banach von triples. Also, they will arise from time frequency analysis. Now, um, uh, yeah, this maybe I'm switching directly now to the situation of the MATLAB file. Uh, let me see. Yeah, here it is. But I have to switch to a new window. Okay, yeah. I think this is uh, roughly speaking uh, resuming the session where we have been. So I would say from a linear algebra point of view, and I was choosing uh, the situation that we have signals of length 480. This is really a random experiment. So the last time I was rerunning this was giving this here. And it's interesting because I'm getting 960 elements. And if I'm not mistaken, that's exactly two times n. That's kind of a lucky strike. So each of these points represents a time frequency shift. So you can say these are points in a complex plane in a discrete periodic complex plane. And so each point represents a unitary time frequency shift operators. Recall time shift is cyclic shift. So you take the function as a function of the cylinder and you rotate it, you rotate the cylinder, so to say, or you take the free transform and rotate, which is the same as multiplying with the rows or columns. It's a symmetric matrix of the Fourier matrix. So I'm producing in this way for such a point set an irregular GABA family. And this GABA family in this particular case happens to have 960 elements. And I'm asking, well, does it generate everything? And how? what is the condition number? Roughly speaking, you could say certain vectors have a representation which has a cheap representation, so other require a very expensive representation. And, um, and then uh, the quotient of these worst case, extreme cases is uh, the number 100. Now, if I see this picture, I would say roughly speaking, I know from experience, this has to do with the density and the rough, uh, the, the sparsity. So because there are relatively big holes here, and relatively uh, high accumulation points, not really clusters or so, but um, I expect that the condition number would not be very great. So if you would add a few more points in those uh, sparse areas, maybe like here, you would get some better condition number. If you remove some of the redundant points, you get something here. So essentially, this gives you an idea. And uh, what I wanted to show you that's just um, for illustration uh, is if you want to recover from this family, so we have 2n in this case building blocks, all of these time frequency shifted Gaussians, discrete Gaussian, and they are generating the whole space. But uh, um, when you're saying I'm, I want to see the coefficient mapping, so how how may, I mean, I need again 960 elements which produce those 960 coefficients which are required for minimal normal least square representation. 
I have just to take the rows of the pseudo inverse. So I take the matrix transpose and the pseudo inverse afterwards. And so I put a random number. So that what you see here is element number 369. Now, this is another thing that I would like to tell you that nowadays, whenever I want to see, understand the signal, I look at the short time Fourier transform. So this is the continuous, it's just like a, a kind of a detector, energy detector. So for this element, which is assigned to the point, which is marked here as a yellow star, um, there is an element which has, uh, is a dual element. And this dual element is a nasty function. It looks like this, you don't see very much. But if we take the spectrogram, you'll see it's located nearby. So it's at some place. Now, if I would repeat the experiment, uh, maybe I can do that here. Then uh, I would get another number probably, and uh, that will uh, be placed at a different location. I'm not sure if it will, uh, how, how slow it will go. But uh, what I want to show you here is why is this shape relevant for the recovery from this sample? So we are having two different problems, which are equivalent in frame theory. One is to recover the sampled short time free transform, in this case, from these 960 samples, or to use these 960 elements as building blocks. Now, probably I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. And the question is, why, why is this shape here so interesting or relevant or so? Uh, should it be not be very much concentrated? Well, what would be the effect? And the effect is the locality of the reconstruction. So here I'm showing you the reconstruction using these coefficient mappings and using all the coefficients for the sampling points which are inside of this circle. So you're roughly speaking, um, you're taking the spectrogram, you're taking those sampling points which are only inside and then you reconstruct. And what the statement is with the pseudo inverse, if you have the full spectrogram sampled at all the 960 points, you get the full reconstruction of the spectrogram and therefore uh, of the signal, but you would like to do it locally. So uh, you see there are some deformations, it goes out a little bit, but roughly speaking, what you can say if you have uh, knowledge about the quality of this the family of dual spaces, then you can reconstruct locally. So if you're using all the samples in, in this circle, maybe a little bit larger than this circle, you increase the radius, you can recover. And the details here are really the details of this. So here, what, once more, here you see on the left-hand side, the local reconstruction. And on the right hand side, you see the original spectrogram just uh, with, with the location, so viewed locally. Now, uh, I was specifically for this uh, talk, I was redoing an experiment which I have done very long a time ago, and that's the following. Well, I look at the shape of the spectrogram of the dual element for number, uh, what is it, 363? and uh, say it's well concentrated here. But if I move this point to the region and I do this for all these 960 elements and I take the pointwise maximum and you see here it's assumed, it's a local zoom. I see that all the dual, fam all the dual atoms of this family are equally concentrated. But this is very important for the mapping properties of analysis synthesis property for uh, synthesis mappings for the GABA that you have this uniform concentration of the dual atoms. So even for the aerial case. Now, uh, uh, this is probably still, and yeah, this is another, I have not uh, done this. Here you see, you can get a local density by convolving uh, the point set, it's another point set with a two dimensional Gauss function, which is done easily. And you see here, you have a peak here and you have valleys here. And of course, uh, the Gauss function, which is located in the in deepest valley is the one which you can represent with the biggest effort only, whereas it's very easy to represent some other Gauss function located here because you have many copies here. So assume you have 100 copies almost of the same type to represent uh, a function. You take uh, one over 100 as a coefficient 
with 100 copies, but the two norm of a one, a sequence of 100 ones is just square root of 100, which is 10. So the L2 cost of such a representation is very low. It's one over 10 only. So having a lot of accumulation makes representations locally very cheap. Having no points nearby makes it very expensive. And that quotient of these two makes the condition number. Now, I was concluding last time that, of course, when you have a regular situation, everything is much better. And I tell you, you can take a, a rectangular lattice or another lattice. The point is it has to be a lattice, so a subgroup. And that's why I'm choosing a good number for the 80 has a lot of divisors. And then you can do the same thing with the pseudo inverse. Uh, you don't have, I mean, you, you should go maybe through the coefficients, but you see here, I take a random signal. I can take the samples of the short time Fourier transform and I can reconstruct. So all these comp norm commands say, well, I'm comparing the original signal with the one reconstructed from the coefficients using the dual window and so on. So this is all just indicating everything is in good order. Um, and uh, so the typical picture would be if you're having a lattice, in this case, again, with 720 points, and you want to reconstruct your signal or your spectrogram from these 720 sampling values, you only need to have a synthesis window, or you're saying, please use these dots as billing blocks. So you take the Gauss function, how can I get coefficients? And then you have to take the dual window in order to get the coefficients. So the short time free transform with the dual window sampled at exactly the same position as this. So this is the regular case where you have only one dual window which you move around here. And I'm just showing you two examples. This is for uh, the case that I'm using most of the time, A equal 20, B equals 16, so two divisors which produce this lattice with redundancy three over two. And you see there's a little bit of dip, a little bit of a side lobe. If I go to the free transform of this, then you see less of it, or no dip actually, and more stronger side lobe. Now the used discrete Gauss function is free invariant or FFT invariant in the discrete case. And therefore the change of A to B to B and A also is the same as taking the Fourier transform. So you can say this is the dual window, the one that picks up the right coefficients, the minimal norm coefficients, if you're taking the lattice with small A and big a, a, B, a, B. So it's, it's uh, 16 is A here and 20 is the B here. Now, just to tell you, it looks nice that the dual window is a real valued function but if your lattice is an oblique lattice, then the dual window, the minimal norm is, uh, is, is also, uh, will, will be complex value. So you see a certain form of imaginary part. Um, you have this definite property that the dual window of a real valued window is real valued if the lattice has the property that it's flip invariant with respect to the horizontal axis. So certain hexagonal lattice also have real valued dual windows. I'm not sure, but I think it's not known whether um, uh, uh, whether there exist situations of really oblique lattices where for certain windows, the dual window can be chosen to be real valued. I think that's a, a, like an open question or so. Now, uh, if you maneuver through this family of lattices, uh, then we do here a pairing we plot log a over n uh, divided, uh, log a divided by log n against log b over log n. So that means every point here represents a lattice or a pair of lattice constants. So you see the divisors that we have are two, three, four, and so on. And it's a little bit narrow here, maybe here is here 16, 20, 24, and so on. So what are the good lattices or where is our lattice that we have chosen? Well, it should be one constant A was 20, the other was 16. So it's some point in this area. Now, if you look at these lines, then you have integer redundancy. Though these are all the lattice points that are found on this blue line have redundancy two or four or two or three or four or five or so. And therefore you find the critical lattices at this point. So the critical lattice simply means your lattice has exactly as many points 
as building blocks and you say, oh yeah, that's good. Then we have N signals or square matrix where all the matrices, all the entries, all the signals in the Gabor family are the rows and we have exactly N. So we just have to make sure it's invertible. And that's actually the situation. So if you would take a square number like 24 squared, you could put the, exactly the midpoint that would be 24. You take the lattice 24, 24, and you say, oh, now I take a discrete Gauss function. Then I understand in a discrete setting what Gaber wanted to do. Now, I think it's a good way to understand it, but, uh, uh, well, first, yeah. First, I want to tell you that uh, if you go here, to the limit here. This is A equal B equal one. That means the hugest redundancy, you take the continuous, meaning the fully discrete short-term Fourier transform. So it's very easy to reconstruct a function from its completely computed short-term Fourier transform, but you have redundancy N for a signal of length and you produce N squared pixels. Now on this side, of course, you have the lattices which are big, like I don't know, uh, 30 times 30, uh, there are not enough points, and therefore these points, families, are appear to be not useful. Now it turns out that they are useful for communication, and then you are interested to have maximal communication. So recall my piano reconstruction theorem. If I use this lattice, that would mean I'm playing harmonic tones to you, and you're analyzing this, and you're saying, oh yes, I understand how much of each frequency is coming here. The frequency distance is big, so it's a well-tuned piano. I'm waiting from one strike to another, so the time lattice is big, then it's easy to decipher it. But the faster I'm playing, or the, the more densely the frequencies are, the more difficult it gets. And you can say this re-space is property, re-sequence property is getting more interesting as you move towards the critical line. And the Gabor problem is getting more interesting in terms of low redundancy as you get here, but what happens with the dual window? And that's what this next window is showing. If you're close to the critical, it looks like this. So it's both more spiky and broader. Or if you go to the extreme case and you do the pseudo inverse, yes, the pseudo inverse is again starting from one function and it has this shape. Now, this is really the discrete version of something which is called the Bastian's window. So an optical engineer, Martin Bastians in 1980 was computing this. It looks like cusps which are going to infinity, but no, they are a bounded function, but it's not an LP for any P which is any finite. And if you try to use it, you find out that it's not allowing to recover everything. It's There is one dimension missing and therefore um, in MATLAB, you just build this family and you can say, well, is there anything which is perpendicular to the range? So something which is um, not, uh, which cannot be represented. And then you find out that this function is this one dimension that is missing. And you see, uh, this is a function which, which is alternating plus and minus. So to, this is normalized version, but you can take plus one, minus one. Now the distance, is exactly the time shift parameter. So I think I was taking A equal 20 and the frequency parameter N over 20, so 24. 24 times 20 is 480. And if you look at this, then you see it's a, a Dirac comp, which is at position 11 and 11 is just zero, which is first MATLAB coordinate plus 10, it's one half of 20. And the other is, this minus 10, so this just uh, it should be the, the limit should be 240 because only the frame is a little bit too wide. Okay, so you have coordinates plus one at coordinate number 11, then plus 20, it's 31, it's a minus one, plus 20 coordinate plus one. And so this is something, a vector which is represented, which is not representable with this critical Gabor system. So you see, in this case, there is a clear loss of dimension and uh, not everything can be represented. Now, on the other hand, if you take this family and you synthesize, there must be a, a coefficient mapping, also a one dimensional space, which allows to uh, synthesize, so some, some non-trivial kernel of the synthesis mapping. So I'm taking this Gauss function again with 24, 20 horizontal shift, 
24 modulation. And uh, then this pattern, which turns out to be again a plus minus one pattern is giving zero and really in the MATLAB sense, strictly zero. So you're taking a Gauss function, negative Gauss function shifted by 20, a positive by 40, a negative by 60. And the same with modulated versions. And all these things add up exactly up to numerical precision to zero. So whereas in the finite dimensional case, the critical family really has a loss of dimension in the infinite dimensional situation you have um, uh, just difficulties, let's say. You don't have a frame. Now, if you look at everything from the Hilbert space point of view, which means just from the two side, you are saying, well, why are you so seeing so many problems? Uh, because you can take the rectangular function. So in this case, let me say you take the indicator function of zero one, or in this case, uh, or a constant sequence, which is C constant one from first to 20, so from zero to A. And then you multiply it with the frequencies from zero to 24 and everything is fine. You get an orthonormal basis. And so why, why are you so unhappy with the Gaborian orthonormal basis? And the answer is, well, look at the spectrograms arising from this sharp rectangular cutoff. So I'm taking a random function, a random complex valued functions. And I simply say, take a look at the spectrogram of a rectangular window and here of a Gaussian window. And it's clear that this is much better localized. It has it here. I mean, depending on whether you do a shift by one or two pixels, you get completely different coefficients. Everything isn't, that's not really good information about uh, the underlying signal or so. Whereas here you have a very nice picture. So it's very plausible that you can reconstruct. And the main point is you can reconstruct from very few relevant peak coefficients because we should not say that we have to reconstruct from the full set of coefficients without noise, but we would like to reconstruct maybe locally, maybe from noisy data, maybe with thresholding. So this is the reason why the rectangular window looks so good from the ordinary Hilbert space point of view. But if you go further and, uh, and look at uh, the, uh, at the, local representation point of view, uh, then you are having a, a problem. Okay, um, the next thing that I wanted to just quickly summarize is the following. Time frequency analysis is uh, the combination of time shift, frequency shift operators. Now, of course, since they are unitary operators in the finite dimensional setting, they have uh, matrix representations. And these matrix representations uh, are uh, just, I mean, what is a shift operator? You move the unit vectors by three units to the right. And if you do take a time frequency shift, in addition, it's multiplied with a pure frequency in this direction. So this is the shape of, I mean, the, the, just the positions where you have non-zero entries. And what are the entries in the diagonal? Well, these are the pure frequencies. So uh, how many such frequencies, time frequency shifts can you produce? Well, and time shifts and frequency shifts, you get n squared. Looking at this and taking everything in the level of pixel images, you are Frobenius norm or Hilbert Schmidt norm, you see that these operators are really an orthonormal basis. So every matrix can be written as a superposition. You can study this in, in detail. Every matrix can be written as a, a superposition of those time frequency matrices. and uh, yeah, let me see. Yeah, I'm just telling you that the taking a scalar product in the Hilbert-Schmidt sense usually says, well, take the Hilbert-Schmidt operator, compose it with the transpose of the adjoint of the other one and take the trace afterwards. I'm telling you it's computationally much easier to take the matrix, con con uh, convert it into a column vector of length n squared and take the ordinary scalar product. So these are really the same you see here. And uh, so what I want to show by this experiment is that two such time frequency shift operators are really just orthogonal to each other. 
And therefore, every matrix can be represented as a superposition. So that's just linear algebra at the level of matrix or tensors, if you want. And uh, maybe I'm jumping over this here. Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah. The, the only thing I wanted to show you is that uh, the pure frequencies, again, are not just uh, something that exists and is very useful, but they're just the eigenvectors of arbitrary convolution operators. But maybe it's uh, too time consuming to go through the details here. So uh, yeah, I think I, I better go to the last step here. And that's the following, that if you're taking uh, the Gabor frame operator, which we will discuss in a moment. So it's I usually say it's taking the Gabor family as if it was an orthonormal system. So you're taking scalar products with your family, and then you synthesize with these coefficients. And uh, then you're doing this spreading representation. So you write the Gabor frame operator as a superposition of time frequency shift operators. Then what you find out that only a certain, po certain positions are occupied. So it's a representation, like an experimental evidence, I would say, of course, an illustration of a theoretical statement at the end, that the spreading function of the Gabor frame operator is sitting on a lattice. You can do this for different lattices, and each time you find out that uh, there is a lattice, and the lattice has lattice constants which are of the form n over b, n over a. So you have a, b as lattice constants, n over b, n over a are the corresponding that you find here. And the big values are exactly this here. Now, uh, the explanation is uh, again uh, the following. For every lattice of time frequency shift operators, there is an adjoint lattice. Adjoint means that you have time frequency shift operators which commute with the original ones. The more elements your lattice has, the more, uh, the smaller the adjoint group will be. If you take all the time frequency shift operators and you ask who is commuting with all of them, you're left with the scalar multiples of the identity. But in our case, we want to have a lattice with three over two uh, times n elements. And it turns out that the adjoint lattice has exactly uh, two third of n so inverse of the redundancy times n, and this is uh, obtained by changing the position and replacing n, a and b by n over a, n over b. So from a, b, you come to n over b, n over a. But in the general setting with the oblique lattice, you have still the same numbers, but uh, a, different, a different realization. Here you see the joint lattice for my oblique lattice. And the relevant terms are always concentrated here. And this has much to do with the following observation, that if you do this, sorry, maybe I'm, I'm yeah, maybe I just mentioned it. If you're um, taking the projection operator, so this is uh, for an, a Gabor atom of norm one, it's the mapping F goes to scalar product of F with G against G. And then you say, well, this is an operator. You find a rank one operator. Can you write it as superpositions of time frequency shifts? Then you find out, yes, you can do it. And it's just the short time Fourier transform. So it's a new interpretation of the short term Fourier transform. So what we see here is an experimental evidence about what is called the Janssen representation. So the short time, uh, the, the Gabor frame operator in, this is the, Jans, this, uh, the spreading picture in the Janssen representation. And what you see here is there's some peak here, and here it's BGG at zero. So that's G scalar product with G, which of course is just the L2 norm of your window squared. And normally you take this to be one. So if you have a normalized window in L2, you will have coefficient one here. And you have other coefficients for these other time frequency shift operators. So if somebody is asking you, well, if you know that this is a representation, the Gabor frame operator for a given lattice lambda can be viewed as multiply the VGG with these point measures, you get a one here. And then you observe that all the others together is a sum of unitary operators 
with a total sum of less than one, then you know immediately, then by the ordinary Neumann series, the operator must be invertible and must have an inverse, which is uh, guaranteeing you that you have a frame and then every element can be represented. You have a Gabor frame or so. So um, I think it's um, more than high time to change back to the slides and uh, tell you a little bit more about what we have been doing here, how to do this in a continuous setting. And uh, so I hope it was not too confusing. And I will switch again uh, to the new uh, slide. Yeah, I hope it's the right one, yeah. So, uh, the, I will, before giving you the details, I would like to say, well, the goal will be this banach gelfand triple. So there is a specific Banach algebra of functions of continuous integrable functions, which we will use. And uh, the, the overall goal will be to have systems that allow you to expand a function into uh, with coefficients and both the building blocks and the coefficient operation should be local unlike the bad one that we have seen in the critical case. So you see that Gabor was suggesting in the continuous case, take the Gauss function, let this constants A equal B equal one. And he was overlooking, uh, ignoring or not, not aware that this means that it, not every element can be represented. And even if you try to represent good functions, the convergence is very poor and the, uh, the co coefficients are obtained in a bad way. Now, uh, I think one uh, way to understand what we have done in linear algebra, uh, and which I think might be relevant for, for other situations as well, and that's why I'm spending a little bit time on this, is the linear algebra situation that you can learn from studying the singular value decomposition. So um, there are a lot of symbols, but I try to explain it to you in, in a very naive way. If anybody is giving me a harmless matrix, let's say you're giving me a, a five by seven matrix, or let's say seven by five matrix uh, of rank three, then for me, it means you're giving me seven row vectors, all of them uh, in a five dimensional space, but together they span only a three dimensional space. Now you can take the matrix as a linear mapping, of course, and then you have a, a target space and a null space. So every matrix is a linear mapping. It has a range and a null space. And of course, every matrix has a transpose matrix and that also has a null space and a range space. So from any given matrix, I'm telling you that you have four spaces. Uh, two are subspaces of R7 and two are subspaces of R3. And when I tell you that they are this, the matrix has rank three, of course, you know that rank is also the rank, uh, row rank equals column rank. So you know that the rows, but also the columns span a three dimensional space. So inside of those R7, R5, you have a three dimensional space. And now the important harmless thing is, well, look at the null space of your matrix. Well, these are all the vectors which are mapped onto zero, of course. But if you say, well, it means this, then you mean it's a, a solution to the homogeneous equation. Or so it means something which is perpendicular to each single row. So it's perpendicular to each linear span of elements. So the nulls, you have to recall at one line proof, the null space of a matrix is the same as the orthogonal complement of the row space of A. Of course, it's better to think of the row space of A as uh, the column space of the transpose matrix. In the complex domain, you should say it's the column space of the, of the uh, transpose conjugate matrix. But for a short illustration, this is fine. Now, if you take transpose or transpose conjugate, you have the same role. So when is, for example, a matrix, the columns of a matrix generating everything, we say it's a frame. Well, if and only if the null space of the adjoint mapping of the transpose matrix is trivial. 
and so on. One is a matrix uh, uh, injective. So when are the columns of a matrix linear independent? Well, if and only if this orthogonal complement is trivial or so. So you have many ways of, of, uh, of, of uh, using these spaces. And another quite important thing is if you think of the row space, and again, I think it, you, should, you should say it's the column space, and you apply the matrix multiplication to the columns of the transpose matrix, then uh, you're uh, part to the orthogonal complement, then you're getting zero. So cut away from your domain, from your seven dimensionals. No, I was saying seven times five. So if you're mapping from R5 to R7, take away the null space of your mapping, and then you have an injective mapping. So roughly speaking, singular value or geometric considerations tell you every rank three operator between two such n-dimensional and m and n-dimensional spaces is nothing else but choosing two pairs of three-dimensional spaces, mapping them isometric, isomorphically, sorry, one to the other, and that's the mapping. Of course, you can project first uh, on the uh, on the on the three-dimensional space in the domain and at the end you can embed in the larger space but what should be the inverse of course you take this isomorphism of the three-dimensional space so which is column space and you map it back to the row space and that's exactly what the pseudo inverse is doing so the pseudo inverse is mapping the column space back to the row space if you're giving me a general vector in the domain and you project onto the column space, then you go back and that's the solution to the minimal normally square problem. So we have a lot of tricks or so, but the best way to understand it is the following, taking diagrams, because diagrams can be also done in functional analysis. So as usual, uh, N, M by N matrix is in using a linear mapping from Rn to Rm, and the range is the column space. But you can also say, before doing the mapping, you, you throw away the null space. So you're mapping on the orthogonal complement of the null space, which is exactly the row space. So at this level, you have a one-to-one -one mapping in the case of a, of a mapping, uh, of a general mapping. Now, if you have a general matrix, so in my, so what was it, five by seven, seven by, no, no, seven by five case, then you have a target space, you have a null space, you have a null space of this and the row space. And then you have a pseudo inverse. I mean, what is the mapping itself? Well, you start with the vector, you project it onto the row space. That means you're throwing away anything which is a null space. You take, for a given element in the in the target space, you're taking the shortest vector which has the same image. So the difference is only something in the null space. So you're getting short, shorter vectors, and then you're embedded. And of course, uh, the pseudo inverse is just undoing this. So it's projecting onto the column space. You're changing from the right hand side B, which is not in the column space, to the best approximation from the column space. Then you choose among all the possible elements which are mapped here, the one which is the shortest, because everything else here has not only the part in the row space, but something from the orthogonal uh, complement, which is the null space. So the pseudo inverse is undoing this diagram. Now again, uh, these diagrams are fine. And if the column space is everything, that means the columns are spanning everything, this part is disappearing. And if uh, the space is linear independent, this part is disappearing and you have an embedding. And uh, in the isomorphic case, of course, we know that uh, it's just inversion of a matrix and the inverse is the pseudo inverse or so. So the singular value decomposition in MATLAB or in the theory or Hilbert compact operators tells you, well, there's an orthonormal basis for both spaces First in the domain, it's called V1, V2, V3, in our case, spanning the row space and the remaining vector spanning the orthogonal complement, the null space. There's a scaling matrix, and in our case, it's S1, S2, S3 are non-zero, the rest is zero, and then embedding into the U. So you have two systems 
and the image of the V vectors uh, in under A are just rescaled vectors. So an orthonormal system, which is mapped into a rescaled orthonormal system up to the rank of the matrix. And that's written here. You have take the coefficients, rescale and synthesize in the U basis. And what is the A, pri A plus doing? Well, you're undoing the rescaling and you're mapping back U to V. And that's really the role of the inverse. So uh, we have a situation which is nice. And uh, something which I like to tell you is that whenever you're doing compositions now, you're doing A with a prime, A, a prime with A or so. And even if the matrix is not uh, normal, so A prime A is not the same as A prime, the null spaces always are on one side. So you can take the pseudo inverse or so. All these mappers map from are five to our seven or seven to five. But they all have the same null space and they all have the same range, which is very good because that gives you a lot of formulas. And um, yeah, the, this is the linear independent case and uh, the, the, the frame case. So where you have this representation. Okay, now uh, if we jump to Hilbert spaces, uh, you're saying, and that's now the motivation for the standard definition of a frame. You're saying, well, I'm starting from this Hilbert space of signals and I'm doing coefficients, but I hope that I can come back. Now we're at the problem that this might, the range might not be a closed subspace. But if you have an abstract Hilbert space and you're going to the standard Hilbert space L2 of the index set, and if you want to have a closed range so that you can get this complete picture, it's if and only if you have normal equivalence, and that's the definition. So you're starting here with normal equivalence, and then the rest of the diagram is automatic. But the diagram is the relevant thing and not, not the normal equivalence. Because if you're saying I'm generalizing now, I have a Banach space, I have LP space here, well, you might have an isomorphism to a closed subspace of LP without having a complemented situation. So to have a projection, and go back or to have a reconstruction operator, which is such that first taking coefficients, then reconstruction is identity is really relevant and that's expressed in the best way by this. So I'm trying to jump now to spend a few minutes on the, on the continuous situation now. So what is time frequency analysis? Everything that you can build from time and frequency shift operators especially the short time Fourier transform. So you move around your G as a sensor in the phase space, and you correlate your function F and you want to see at time T, how much of the energy frequency omega is in the signal. And for short term notation, we write G lambda for this time frequency shifted. The pi is a so-called projective representation. We have seen it in MATLAB how it works. And um, let me see, I hope I will. Yeah, so standard plot is, there are so many function spaces just for your orientation. I would like to talk, especially next time about this triple S zero, which is a little bit larger than the short space, but still inside L1, L2, any LP space. We have L2 here, of course, it's important, the Hilbert space, and a zero prime, which is big enough to contain all the LP spaces, but it's much smaller than the space of temporal distributions, whereas a zero is containing a short space as a dense subspace. So why, before telling you much about the zero space, why it is relevant to have such a space and uh, why do we have all these uh, spaces around? Now, the first thing is to say, well, we can define uh, modulation spaces, for example, as subspaces of the space of tempered distribution. So for people who are familiar with tempered distributions, that's fine because you're saying, well, I have to just let, I let my distribution sigma act on a time frequency shifted version on my G lambda. And I would take the Gauss function. Then this is a Schwartz element. So sigma applied to a, such a modified Gauss function is a meaningful thing. Well, if you know tempered distribution, this is fine. 
and you will find out that this is a continuous function and it grows at most like a, like a polynomial. So it's at most like one plus x squared plus omega squared to some integer power, for example. On the other hand, you can say, well, what does it mean to have um, good decay? What does it mean? Maybe one is a tempered distribution of Schwartz a rapidly decreasing function. Well, it turns out if and only if this function, this VG0, is decaying faster than any polynomial. So it's faster than any inverse of such a polynomial or so. What can you say about L2? And the nice thing is if you normalize your window G, then you have an isometric embedding. So the F goes to F, G of F is giving you an isometric embedding. And this is really, you can definitely read details in the book of Charlie Grok and again, most of the representations is the key to find the inversion formula. Because if you have any isometric embedding of, a, of some Hilbert space into a larger Hilbert space, it turns out that the adjoint mapping is the inverse on the range. So what you have to do is just to say, well, what is the adjoint of this here? And in matrix analysis, it's quite clear. Computing the sampling values of the short time free transform is just taking scalar products with my collection of row vectors. So what is the joint? Well, do matrix synthesis. So do linear combinations of these row vectors. So the joint of VG zero is synthesis. You're giving me a bunch of coefficients numbers in the living on a lattice and I would do a synthesis. Now, if it's a continuous situation, then you would replace the sum by an integral. And then the usual statement is that this integral is weakly convergent. So if you want to compute an individual coordinate, let's say in an autonomous basis, then you can do it and so on. Now, uh, time is running out. So I will try to only mention a few things where, where this properties are, are kind of relevant and, and uh, start there next time. So in these papers, you find information about the following questions. So I kind of, I want to chase the diagram as we did before, but now with continuous variables. So we want to say, you give me a function F in the Hilbert space L2, and we sample the short term Fourier transform along such, such a lattice, which is now of course infinite. Is this a bounded mapping? All the functions are, uh, the spectrogram is continuous, it's L2, but the restriction might not be nice. So you need some condition. If you're in a zero, particularly if you're in Schwartz, of course, you're fine with this. If you do the synthesis here, you see the joint in explicit form, you take the coefficients and it will be bounded. If you combine the two one, then now here you have finally the Gabor frame operator, you're taking the coefficients with respect to a family and doing the synthesis. So in terms of the matrix multiplication, it's just um, you're doing a combination of A with A prime. So first you apply your matrix A prime uh, to get the coefficients with your collection of vectors and then you do synthesis. And this operator is supposed to be invertible. That's equivalent to the spanning property uh, because it's apparently that here the matrix is invertible if and only if it's no null space. It's a matrix in our discrete case and uh, invertibility is the same as having no null space and so on, so you see. Now, uh, what is also important is because sometimes I see papers now where people say, well, I'm fixing the G and the Lambda and I want to know the mapping properties. No, I would like to use a window and you should be allowed to choose the lattice. So I would like to know is the frame bound, they're, they're bound for these operators uniformly bounded for all reasonable lattices. So maybe lattices which are too uh, dense should be avoided or so, but Let's say your A and B is in some range between one half and five or one over 10 and 20 or whatever. Compact ranges of lattices should allow common bounds and that's possible. You also expect uh, that, uh, uh, maybe I'm jumping too far and I should just mention this. So you would like to know what happens if I change the G a little bit. Well, then you have samples with a similar window you expect, and that's correct, that you're getting the same 
what you're getting similar coefficients, similar in the L2 sense. And if you do the synthesis and you synthesize with similar atoms, you hope that you are still controlling this. Yes, it's true. If you replace G by G1, for example, an infinitely supported Gauss function by a compactly supported Gauss function, then you will have an operator which is close by. So it's invertible in the limit if and only if it's invertible for all the elements which are close to the limit. It's much more interesting and also true here that if you're changing the, the lattice, then it's not a norm continuity, but only strong operator continuity. So you're changing the lattice lambda AB to A1, B1, and you hope that you're getting similar lattices, uh, similar operators, well, in some sense, yes. And you invert this operator and you hope that the inverse operator, which is giving you the dual window is still giving you a similar dual window. That was not at all uh, trivial or so, but it turned out to be true. So there are two important statements, one that I only mentioned, that if the operator as G lambda is invertible on L2, it will be invertible on the zero. That's important because that tells you, or is equivalent, that for every good window, which means for me, G in a zero, the dual window will all be in a zero. Now, if you change the lattice from, let's say, irrational to rational, you also get uh, something which is very similar. So that such a robustness is very important uh, to, to study everything from the finite discrete setting. And I think uh, my time is now over and therefore I would like to stop uh, the, the presentation. So let me just get out for a moment and uh, encourage you to, so I'm, I'm uh, 